This is Reasonable Doubt with your hosts, Mark Garrigus and Adam Carolla. Yeah, get it on. Got to get on a choice. We're going to mandate get it on and welcome to the best hour in the universe. Wait a second. You know what I just noticed? Hmm. You were mocking me Armenian flag last week. Do you remember this, Gary? Right? He said it wasn't the best color scheme. Uh, yeah. Excuse me. Look at his shirt. All he's missing is orange. I'm orange, wearing, red, blue. I you're got, like, you're two thirds Armo right now. I got, uh, <laughs> he might be three fourths because that's also the BMW M colors. And mm-hmm. that's yeah, a they popular, like, like those people. Popular well, car. and by the way, that is a popular Armo car if you black it out and you drive around in Glendale. That's I, probable cause to be pulled over, by the way. I, Armo uh, in a blacked out uh, M. So I reject that accusation, but Gary, I do want to talk to you about jewelry after the show. So just yeah, make a, he's make got a he's got a large pinky ring. He wants me to get him. But, so um, wait, all right. So where where do we start? There's so many things we could talk about, and uh, you know, no matter what we talk about, somebody's going to get angry. So well, we we were on the subject right before the mics got yeah. hot about Burbank uh, article. Mike August sent me this morning about Burbank has now hired the Pinkertons, essentially. Uh, uh, evidently, the police is, are not enforcing the mask laws. So right. they've, got their, they've, they've procured their own security force to um, enforce these laws. Okay. Anybody who gets one of these tickets, I'm not soliciting, but I'm going to give you a blueprint for how to challenge that. They don't have the authority to outsource a police force uh, when you're a charter city. So don't uh, anybody who pays for this. You might remember years ago. Do you remember? I think it was Beverly Hills. I could be wrong where they outsourced red lights to the cameras and the company. And I never understood why people complied with that because it was totally illegal and unconstitutional also. Beside the fact that the machine can't testify, so why would you submit to it? Right. So if you do get one of these citations, what should you do? Challenge it. Challenge it. Absolutely challenge it. There's, they've got no authority to outsource the uh, police department. And see, this is part of – we talked about this a while ago. Part of the way – the irony of all of this – is that the only time that these guys get um, kind of checked, and when I say these guys, people who are ruling these communities, is when they issue these orders and then you get somebody like the Orange County Sheriff who says, go pound sand, I'm not enforcing this. Or the Halloween, remember that edict? Yeah, we're not going to have Halloween and it's going to be a crime. And the sheriff came out and just said, well, we're not enforcing that, you're out of your mind. And that's the only time. So now they've decided, one of these guys who's decided that they're smarter than the average bear is going to um, uh, hire a private police force that, you know, to some degree, that's government uh, basically saying we we're, we're admitting we're dysfunctional, that we do not know how to function. Well, it seems to, you know, shine a light on a couple of uh, a couple of issues. They're called the Wilden Engineering. I like the very ominous engineering. Put like, like Wilden. We're going to break your will. We're going to break your will and we're going to re-engineer society. <laughs> yeah, we'll Sorry, Gary, yes. do you have that article? I do. The article cites Wilden as a consulting firm selling professional, technical, and consulting services to public and private utilities, public agencies, and commercial and industrial firms. Who's it owned by? I'll, I'll look into that for you. Yeah, and, it, and the background of the owner. See if Hunter Biden bring. is on the board. <laughs> So this is this is and see if there's there's emails that were dropped off at a video store somewhere. This but. is Orwellian to me. It really is. The first thing the first part of it is there is no science that suggests we need to wear masks outdoors. There just isn't. Well, it's there's science that that provides the counter to that. The, number Number one, so you really – you don't even have a motivation to do it except for – Well, explain to me – this is what bugs me. The All the science that we now know that uh, that it's aerosol. We now know ventilation indoors is bad. We or If it's bad, that that, uh, that can uh, contract it or you can get contracted. I get all of that. Explain to me – because we used to go bonkers when they shut down the trails in La Cunada. Right, right. What was the point of shutting down the trails? Why, and why do you wear a mask on a trail if there's nobody within 10 or 20 feet of you? By the way, you don't see 
and this is crazy, you don't see anybody else when they do a uh, town hall, for instance, you're not wearing the mask when you're 20 feet away, are you? And you're indoors. So why am I outdoors when I'm walking in the morning? Why am I supposed to put a mask on when I'm not within 20, let alone 100 feet of somebody? They they. First things first, we just had a huge Labor Day. It was 121 degrees in Reseda. There are 10 million people on the beach from Ventura to Orange County. I was down there that whole weekend. It was throngs of humanity outdoors, massless on the beach. Uh, no surge. So what are we talking about? You, you, you work at Disney. You walk out. You have a cigarette break. You step out on the sidewalk. I, I don't – so there's no science behind it. And I'll even give them this. I'll even say if you're outdoors and you're within 6, 10 feet. 10 feet is now, they say, there's some evidence 10 feet, right? Sure. I'll give you that. Okay, wear a mask if you're within 10 feet. I just do it because people, you know, as I told you, I get scolded if I don't. That's fine. I'll accept that. But – when, when there's nobody around you or when you're outside and you're spaced, what is the, what's the issue? There is, oh, look, why isn't Disney open? I was listening to the radio on the way in. It's like every other Disney is open, all the other theme parks around the world, around this country, around the nation. There's an article in the New York Times a couple, uh, couple days back or a week ago that basically just said, you know, when they opened uh, Disney World in Orlando, they thought it was going to be cataclysmic. Turns out it worked out great. It you turns notice. out Disney knows what they're doing. They have yeah. protocols. Good. Let's just do that in right. Anaheim. And by the way, you notice that they had a uh, – the governor, your favorite human, had a task force of some kind, Gary. I forget what yes. it was called. And Bob Iger, the president and kind of a revered figure – of Disney resigned from it after he pulled the stunt in Orange County. Now what's happening? Now they've blown a hole in every conceivable budget. And uh, I know you're going to say, or some uh, people tweeted me, if you saw the amount of taxes that we had to pay just yesterday for California, just right. California, I could have, I mean, I, I, it's astonishing to me why uh, even Paulette at this point says, Maybe I'm moving to France. I mean, right. it, there's there's really no way to justify it because the benefits are ridiculous. I, I and um, the in terms of the cost benefit analysis, but beyond that, why can't we? When everybody says we're going to follow the science, why can't we follow the science? Well, if Orlando figured it out, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what it is. It's 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 an adolescent defiance disorder these are the same people that said okay florida ron DeSanta, you uh, go ahead and open the pirates of the caribbean in orlando i'll see you in hell i mean it's going to be a bring a body bag you know that's what they did and nothing happened so they turned out to be wrong but they're not technically wrong until they reopen you know what I mean? So they can sit there with their fucking arms folded and go, I'm still not impressed. And it's like, this game is over. You lost. Open. Let people let people get back to work. And they're like, we haven't lost until – the game's not over until we say it's over. Wait, so we don't say it's over. As a matter of fact, Burbank, we need the Pinkertons to, start, that's, <laughs> the, to enforce the mask rule. What, what I don't understand is why can't we just – look, now they're uh, – the – the argument is going to be, well, the cases are spiking. They're spiking all over the Midwest. They're, you know where they're not spiking? Hmm. California. Right. Okay. Well. Now, you also not want to know something? We I've often talked about this, statu- the rule of statutory construction. When the reason for the rule fails, the, 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 when the reason fails, the rule fails. Well, by the way, we were told initially that this was because of hospital right. and because of ICUs. Right. Okay. I got it. Chris Christie, um, who famously, one of my friends who used to work for him, who was a U.S. attorney, assistant U.S. attorney, used to call him the fat fuck, mm-hmm. or called to his face. <laughs> fat fuck got it. He was in the, that, seriously, it's this true story. He, he uh, that, that was his nickname after my friend called him fat fuck. Um, mm-hmm. He got it. And he comes out and he says, I should have worn a mask. You know, I get it. If you're going up and hugging people, and doing or having, I even think if you're having um, 
if you're sitting, I can even see, I can understand, if you're sitting with more than 10 people outside in a close space for a couple of hours, I could see that. I could see where that, mm-hmm. I could prohibit that. I mean, I could justify that in my mind. I could say that was rational. There's no way to justify, and this is what I mean by the reason for the rule. They have extended it to the point where nobody can accept it because it's not rational. For instance, if you're walking on Georgian with Phil, Mm -hmm. and if it were Burbank, not La Cunada, Mm -hmm. um, and they said you don't have your mask on, and you say, well, there's nobody within 100 feet of me. Right. It makes no sense. So then how are you supposed to accept the rationale in any other way? Uh, All I can do is uh, circle back to the words of the great Mike August and, uh, you know, the election is two and two and a half weeks away and then then it'll all be over. We can we can go back to doing whatever. We just got to we got to get through the election. I I, it's sad, but uh, I, I at this point, there is no other motivating factor that makes sense emotionally or scientifically. It's just. The election has to end, and then Gavin Newsom will let Californians get back to work. It's just, you know, remember when you and I were both uh, pilloried for talking about Sweden? God forbid that you Mm -hmm. talk about other experiments. And then you tweeted the other day. Do you remember what you tweeted about Sweden? It was pretty good. It got a lot of traction. Right. Somebody said, uh, I don't know. Someone said, uh, how's Sweden doing? And I said, uh Basically, I'll paraphrase myself, but uh, when you uh, watch CNN and you see no stories on Sweden, then you know they're doing great. Yeah. And I saw somebody has uh, sent me a couple of pictures and some other things. You know, Sweden had a sensible uh, kind of approach. Sweden understood who was vulnerable. Right. Sweden understood that you protect those who are vulnerable. I mean, one of the reasons I have not... Um, uh, seen my mother since this started is she's vulnerable. I mean, she's right. at the age, she's um, in, uh, immune, uh, compromised, and that's tough. It's, I walk by the house every day and I wish I could go in and see her. But that doesn't mean, I mean, it's just the insanity of this is protect those who are vulnerable and then try not to blow a hole out of your economy at the same time. This isn't an either or a solution. It can no, be. It, but no, it, but it's interesting whenever you hear Gavin Newsom, as we have being interviewed or what have you, there's a cognitive dissonance about the economy in business. It's like it's, it's it's as if it doesn't exist. It's 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 he's not. So most sane leaders and most uh, states, mayors, you know, cities you have to weigh things like there's a weight all the time. And it's going to be like, well, we want safety. But on the other hand, we can't, you know, so it's like, well, drunk driving accidents. We don't like them. Okay. You know, have all the bars closed at 7 PM. It's like, well, but that's a lot of revenue for those establishments. And that's our tax base. And, you know, uh, well, how about 4 a.m.? Well, I think we could do 2 a.m., but they have to be – those businesses make money. The theater's let out. and they, So there's this – you know, it's a yin and a yang, and everyone's kind of weighing those decisions. And every human being from, uh, you know, woman who's balancing the budget or clipping coupons or, you know, making a pot of stew and see if it'll go three days or whatever it is, to anyone who runs a business thinking about hiring or thinking about – you know, I, you run a you run a cabinet shop. You want you know, you can get a ten thousand dollar rip saw, whatever combination saw. It's great, but now you have to sort of weigh that. You go, that's ten thousand now. Now it's going to make me more money, but over what? He doesn't have another side of the scale. So everyone else is constantly doing this dance. You do it all day. I do it all I, you day. You have everyone, to we, do it all day. I, By the way, the social contract relies on. The the social contract, the basis of society is that you have to, at a certain point, have a leap of faith. I mean, if you're walking on the street, I'm walking on the street. I walked on the street this morning. I have a leap of faith that some guy in a car is not going to hit me while I'm walking on the street. That's right. part of the social contract. Okay? If I sit in my bed in the morning and say, I'm not going outside of my beautiful gated house because um, I, I could get hit by a car. I mean, there's a 20, you know, I'm not going to get in my car. I'm not going to drive here to do the podcast. I'm going to do it 
I'm going to do it from my house because the, all the statistics show that I, most accidents happen within 25 miles of home. So right. I'm not going to be 25 miles from home. I'm just going to sit in my bed. You can do that all day long. I had a conversation with um, a couple of bankers yesterday, which was the same kind of logic. They said, I said, well, I've never had this problem in 37 years of practicing law. And the banker said, well, we're not saying that it's you. We're saying what if some clerk at some other bank made a mistake and did this, then we'd be at risk. I said, but it's never happened. And right. it's never happened because I take I, – I said not only do I take the precautions, not only do I have it judicially blessed, but I then have a built-in – um, backup so that there is a punishment for the other side if they screw it up. Yeah, I know, but that's not good enough for us because it could be a risk. I said, but the risk has never happened. And they said, yeah, but we've got to do it this way because there could be, we can envision a scenario where it could happen, even though for 37 years it never happened. How do you argue with that kind of logic? Well, you can, and I've dealt with it. And of course, anytime you deal with a bank and you're trying to get some, a loan or an appraisal or whatever, it's all, it's all a complete pig fuck now but what i'm basically saying in a nutshell people is everybody has to have skin in the game and if you don't have skin in the game then we're never really going to arrive at the at a fair conclusion so the problem with big department of building and safety is they have no skin in the game None so they, whatsoever. they just say you go well here's why i don't have to do this and is there some review panel or something and they go no then write us a check and leave so and so they they don't you have skin in the game i have skin in the game every transaction you go out and buy a taco you have skin in the game they want your money. You want a taco. They have to give you the taco in a timely fashion, and it has to t- has to be up to a certain standard. That that's just the law of nature. Government has skin in the game, but they don't think they have skin in the game. You know, they don't it's interesting. Act like they have skin in the game. You've heard me complain um, ad nauseum about the hot dog truck in front of Tenny. Right. And you know who's completely turned me around on that is my son Jake because he's back here ever since New York basically closed all restaurants um, and is now al fresco, although obviously I don't know what they plan on doing when the weather changes. So Jake was – I was doing my usual rant and Jake said, Dad, understand something. First of all, the guy is parked right in front of the um, – street area where you have now outdoor dining. I mm-hmm. said, yeah, so? He says, well, if a some idiot comes along, it's they're going to hit the taco truck first. I said, right. well, that's a good point, Jake. I like it. He says, you know, you've got an extra added uh, barrier there. And he said, then he said, do you know, Dad, that in the last month, there's been four incidents of psychologically impaired humans assaulting women on the street in front of the taco truck. And I said, yeah, so what? And he goes, the taco guy has come out four, all four times, four for four, with mace, pepper spray, and bashing somebody with a chair when they when they were walking down the street, you know, because in downtown LA, somebody, a woman with a machete is a common occurrence. So he says he's like built in security. And I said, you know, and he says, and the last point that is that he's not competing with what we serve. You're a fine dining. And he's, you know, if I want a taco, I'm in a taco. I'm not going into any. I said, Jake, you changed my mind. I said, I've got built in security here. So what? He doesn't pay taxes or have health department or anything else. And he, and he's, comp- he's not competing with me. So Jake, you uh, t- hat tip to you. That's uh, that's a funny. I mean, God <laughs> bless Jake right. for for putting a. Uh, for... He, he just did a very good analysis. He says it's like built-in security. You've got not only a physical barrier, but he's a guy who's out there who will uh, who will do battle with the fifty-one uh, fifties running around on the street in downtown LA. Because certainly the. The police officers don't care. They're busy. You know, we've got a senior meals um, mm-hmm. uh, program. They, the parking control who does nothing about parking anywhere else, when the taxi cabs come to pick up the meals to take to the seniors, parking control is out there giving them tickets. Isn't that the thing of beauty? They, parking uh, control is there. <laughs> ticket. The city of L.A. is ticketing the city taxis who are already trying to deal with Uber and Lyft who've been given a program to deliver meals to seniors 
by the city of L.A. It's a beautiful clusterfuck of of monumental proportions. I was uh, or say, excuse me, uh, circle jerk of monumental proportions. I was uh, I was listening to uh, Garcetti the other day explain after he's given us uh, rules about Thanksgiving about yeah. how Thanksgiving would work at your yeah. house. After he's done laying that out, he did ended his press conference with, "Oh, and by the way, the parking enforcement it's it's back on." Yeah. So enjoy your Thanksgiving. Yeah. Exactly. All right. Uh, I'm sorry, Gary. Did you have that that article that I never you never yeah, really he's gonna read? Yeah. going to find it. But first, I'm going to say Upstart.com. Welcome. What a great sponsor during these economically turbulent times. Everybody, right, wants to feel more financially secure. Why throw your money away on high interest credit card debt? Upstart. Dot com revolutionary lending platform. You know why? Because they know that you're more than your credit score. Offers smarter interest rates to pay off the high interest credit card debt. So what they do is they go beyond the credit score when assessing your credit worthiness. They do it by rewarding you for your education and job history. What about common sense? That's that what is. they're. Uh, that's exactly what they're doing. Fast and simple way to check your rate. It won't affect your credit score. Once your loan is approved and accepted, most people get their funds. Guess how quick? Guess how uh, quick? Say uh, f- 27 business day. Nope. Next business day. What? Yep. Over 400,000 people have used Upstart. Gary? See why Upstart is ranked top in their category with 4.9 out of 5 rating on Trustpilot and hurry to upstart.com slash doubt to find out how low your Upstart rate is. Checking your rate only takes a few minutes. That's upstart.com slash doubt. Your loan amount will be determined based on your credit, income, and certain other information provided in your loan application. Not all applicants will qualify for the full amount. So I guess the... The, the the long and the short of that article is uh, Disney's doing pretty good in uh, in Orlando. I guess we don't have to get into all the nuts and the bolts it's of that. Just there's, right, yeah, right, there's not a lot to but, get into. But it's, so so the headline he- is wait, what's the headline? I was the headline say. is um uh sorry the headline is at Disney World quote worst fears about virus have not come true. Right. Well, yeah, because you know they. If you do it smart, I just uh, I'd say you don't have. It's not an either or. You can be smart about this. You can yeah, look, and you know who's who's at risk. You know the people who are who are. Well, at risk. yeah, it's not a lot of sick elderly people showing up at Disneyland. So and uh, a lot Scott- of fat fucks because right. uh, because how far can you walk? I mean, right? So it's um, you know you know I said early on on this people got mad, but it's kind of like the Vinny virus. Have you noticed that the the everything that Vinny preaches and talks about mm-hmm. is is those are the people who are most susceptible. So there's a there's a I, I just wish you could take a Drew and a Vinny and Adam, and you could have them model this out. It would be a it would be a spectacular way to approach this. In fact, if you just listen, as as Drew has said, Fauci is the North Star, and if you listen to what Fauci says, he's reasonable about it. If you don't caricature him, but he gets caricatured by both sides, whether it's the left or the right. Well, you know, as I I'm just making a note because it's it's. I'm, a little esoteric, but we squandered an opportunity here because this could have been a teachable moment where we talked about diet and health and morbid obesity and uh, blood pressure and diabetes and everything else. But what we did, and I don't mean us, I mean all the fucking news outlets and all the politicians is they put us all in one hamper. And they said, this thing's a world-class killer, and it'll take you all down. So instead, we could have said, hey, if you're not overweight, if you're healthy, if you're looking after yourself, you're looking after your immune system, if you're exercising, if you're eating right, if you're taking your supplements, this thing's not going to touch you. And then we could have started a campaign based on that information except for they lied to us and said you're all equally you all have an equal chance to get it and it you know it it, it what preys it on, on eight, black people it's been eight months i guess yeah yeah can could, you imagine what you could have done with I, some I, kind of if that first 45 days had just because they knew as of february 7th when trump was on tape with um with uh, Bob Arnson, Woodward, Woodward he knew that it was aerosol. We also knew early on that, or we came to the conclusion, because I remember talking to my 
um, cardiac surgeon friend that it was vascular and that, I mean, he was telling me from day one, get your vitamin D, take your zinc. Right. Get your exercise. Keep your, I mean, he dropped, he stopped drinking immediately and told me stop drinking if it elevates your blood pressure because it was vascular and that's where, that's where the consequences were. What if we had just said, okay, everybody, not only, well, first of all, we're going to lock down. Okay, lock down, but we're going to exercise or we're going to encourage you to do this or we're going to encourage you to do that. Yeah. And and again, if, if you're saying this thing is a killer. But it's not really a killer for Gary. Gary's in good shape. Gary's young. Okay. Gary looks after himself. Fine. It's not so. But it is a killer for that obese person over there. Well, then you would properly motivate that obese person to start working on it. Exactly. And and, and that obviously would be incredibly impactful, but not only impactful as it pertains to the coronavirus, but for years to come, if you could convert that citizen who is, is chronically going to be in and out, all those commercials you see about having to be on dialysis and, you know, centers. No, instead our- what we do is we shut down gyms right. as opposed to – as we, we actually do the opposite of what you should do. You can run a gym – Clearly, you can book solo visits, kind of the Equinox model. I'll give them credit, even though I like to punch them in the face sometimes. But they understood what you had to do. You shut down the steam room. You shut down um, the sauna. You book solo visits. You uh, you have only three people on 50 machines that are there. or some, And you've got generally good ventilation. And by the way, you could have said uh, to – you could have said uh, if the ventilation – is has not been installed in the last X number of years. You can't keep that building open. We do the opposite. You know what we do? We opened up pro- the criminal courts building in Stanley Mosque downtown, which have to be two of the most decrepit buildings with the most decrepit ventilation systems. We cram in as many aggregate people as you can that are strangers, and we tell them you got to be there in court. I mean, but wear your mask, which makes no sense indoors. All right. We're officially dumb. Gary, <laughs> there's there's hot. There's Scott Peterson breaking news. There's also I, I didn't preload you with this one, Gary. So okay. I'm sorry. But there was an article that I heard uh, Prager talking about. I think it was from the new maybe it's from the New York Times. Um, it was uh, a commentator wrote an article about the grand jury testimony uh, about the Brianna Taylor uh, thing and c- kind of went over a lot of the beats of it. And it, it was pretty interesting stuff. But let's go Scott Peterson first. Gary's got – do you have the news, Gary? You want me to do it? I mean I, I've got the story here, but I think you're going to be able to let articulate me, it a lot better. Let me tell you. So I forget the date. Unanimous Supreme Court reversed his uh, penalty, his death penalty, on the basis that – the trial judge over our my team's objections at trial kept telling him he was using the wrong standard. He was excusing anybody who said they didn't support the death penalty. He just summarily excused them, not asking the second question, which is what I kept asking him to do, is say, can they put that aside and follow the law? He wouldn't do that. But if you said I'm pro-death penalty – you you made the cut, which obviously every study shows anybody who's pro death penalty is also pro prosecution. So that was number one, and kind of my um, uh, hesitation about that. The only criticism I would give is if you're saying that the penalty phase was infirm, that it was unconstitutional. How do you say that the guilt phase was okay? Well, mm-hmm. they they nobody is so far. Um, apparently embrace that. However, yesterday, last night, as we're taping this on Friday, the a unanimous Supreme Court on the habeas. So understand the penalty phase was reversed on direct appeal. In California, uh, death penalty goes by direct appeal. You skip the intermediate court of appeal. You go directly to the California Supreme Court. Unanimous Supreme Court took the habeas petition and there were 18 grounds, I think, um, that were listed, 15 of which is that I was ineffective. But ironically, they said they did not embrace any of the Garrigus was ineffective. But they did say that the juror number seven, who was originally an alternate on this case and had not been truthful with the um, with us when we were asking her questions, 
um, had uh, there was now had a restraining order. Yeah, she had, had a restraining order against her boyfriend's ex um, when she was herself pregnant. The irony of this, one of the commentators said this yesterday. It wasn't my comment, but one of the commentators said it's ironic that Scott may end up getting a, a new trial because of the woman who was most uh, vocal about Scott, who's actually, if you believe the press reports, um, written him letters at the uh, at San Quentin. And what? Gary, do you have a picture when of who say, we're talking about? You say most vocal about Scott. How, what do you it mean? came out after the the death penalty when they did their press conference and was was. Well, you'll uh, Gary may find a tape or a picture. She, but she was extremely vocal. And vocal in a in a negative way. In a very negative Sorry. way. Sorry. Yeah. I, I should have been able to read that, but I, I, I she sounds nutty. I didn't I didn't know that. So yeah. she well, Gary will find a picture. So So that if that's the case and the person I mean, understand what you're talking about. You have a purely circumstantial evidence case to begin Ooh, with. Ooh, la. Yeah, there you go. I, I got to say this, uh, just <laughs> a- apropos of something you said moments ago. Um, whenever I hear that somebody takes a restraining order out against somebody, like a neighbor or something like that, it, just because you're the one who filed for it doesn't mean I don't think you're a fucking nut job, too. <laughs> Because nine times out of ten, I'm sorry, it just takes two to tango. It does, and and you can again. There's those all those situations, right? Where you exactly. Get a nutty where, where you get a whatever. nutty husband, you get a violent right. husband. But, but I got a all lot. That, right? Oftentimes, like when a woman takes one out against another woman about, uh, about her predecessor. Her not- Bingo. Bingo. Bingo right, is good. right. I mean, you're so right. I've done a zillion of these, and um, it's there. So understand. Because everybody will say, well, Scott Peterson is guilty. I know he's guilty, the lying scumbag. Okay, understand something. You weren't in the courtroom. And I admitted this. I, I've admitted it for years. The biggest mistake I made was going along with the idea of no cameras in the courtroom. I thought that would damp down the the kind of animus towards him. It had the opposite effect. It allowed the bleach blonde former prosecutors on whatever station to just make up shit. I mean, they could be sitting 3,000 miles away. Things never happened, but they it just became an urban legend. Well, look, it's, it's like the Weinstein case you told me about out of New York City uh, two years ago, where what was going on about the, you know, the, the sidewalk um uh, on the flies, uh, the ATF, yeah, the on the flies, you know, where they, where they pull you aside and they set up the camera and they go, here's what happened today. What was vastly different than what was going on inside the courtroom because you said you knew someone who was inside the courtroom. I knew someone who was inside the courtroom. When he came back with not guilty and they were hung um, and then they ended up folding um, and then you learn afterwards that they're one of those jurors was herself or has already written a book about a predatory older man and a younger woman, you say to yourself, that is your worst fear as a trial lawyer, that you get a stealth juror. And that's what was, uh, in my humble opinion, what was going on here. Ironically, we caught stealth stealth jurors during jury selection. I've told this story before. We caught a young woman. The then prosecutor, who was Rick DeStasso, who's now a Superior Court judge, and I both commented, wow, she was a psychology student. She thought that Scott was guilty, but she talked with her dad, and her dad said, what if this was your brother? And that made her change mm-hmm. her mind. Now, that's, you know, I've, I years ago, I talked to Jerry Spence about this, who's a legendary trial lawyer. And Jerry and I always used to say, when people come up there and say, oh, in one of these high-profile cases, yeah. I've I've never heard about it, or I've heard about it. Yeah, but I I I can be fair. You generally, I'm I have a suspicion. I'd rather have somebody who says, "Yeah, I've heard about it. I think the guy's probably guilty." But I'll and I'll ask, can you do go through the mental gyrations or gymnastics, mental ju- jujitsu to set that aside? I think that's a more honest opinion. In that case, with the woman that I caught. We went back to the hotel where we were staying, and somebody had sent me a – back then it was called a chat room Mm -hmm. – where she was saying, yeah, I fooled that dumb shit defense attorney. I'm going to get on the uh, jury and fry his client. Well, you know, that's – you take a look here. It appears that this is the exact same thing, and that was my biggest fear that somebody was going to get through that. Now, combine that with this. I tried that case – 
with an eye towards, I think, um, I always thought based on the evidence I could win it, but based on the prejudgment rate of uh, prejudice that the best I could hope for was a hung jury, right? Mm -hmm. This woman was an alternate. And mind you, we not only are getting everybody who's anti- death penalty knocked off. So you've got all these pro-death penalty jurors. You've also got, according to Joe Ellen, who, uh, who was um, helping with your jury selection, the highest prejudgment rate of, of guilt that she's ever seen. And the Supreme Court uh, oh. con, uh, uh, substantiated that. Um, so you've got a pool of jurors who you you feel like you're in a, a, a swamp of alligators. You know, oh, at right. any moment, you've got people who are lying. You've got these stealth jurors. So this woman was an alternate. So you're making I'm doing a mental calculation. Okay, it's an alternate. I know what I've got behind me. Um what am I what, am I going to am I going to get rid of her uh as an alternate or is this the best I can do? Anyway, I get deliberations with the jury that I wanted. Mind you, he had removed the judge had removed a couple of jurors who weren't buying anything the prosecution was selling during the trial. Wow. But we finally get to the point where they're deliberating and it's apparent that they're hung. That it's a hung jury. The questions they're asking, right. what they're saying. He removes the judge removes one of the hangers and puts this woman in. Oh. I'm, I lost my mind. So, it's basically uh you know, half the group say green, the other h- half say red. Red means guilty, and you removed the potentially green. You a green, the green juror, and you put them in with someone you already know is red. With, with red, do you? How do you know the person they removed was green? Oh, because when we actually did a. This is part of the record too. We did a in camera hearing, which means we went into chambers. The juror who was the foreperson, my nickname for him was Dr. Lawyer. He had a JD and an MD. He was the foreperson. He reports either day six or day seven on the record that I feel threatened by the other, by a particular juror. I feel threatened by this guy because I feel like at this point, I don't know if I'm giving a verdict that is one according to the law or one according to what the community wants me to do, hmm. and therefore I and I feel threatened by by physically threatened. Mm-hmm. The trial judge's solution to that, I said, Judge, can we talk to the juror and threaten him? No, I'm going to remove him because of this juror, the four person. I said, What do you mean you're going to remove the four person? I'm going to remove the four person because he says he can't deliberate and he doesn't know. I said, What are you talking about? He's saying he's deliberate, not can't deliberate because this guy is threatening him. He does it. He removes him. Guess who became the foreperson? The the guy who was threatening him. Guess right. who was put in the jury at that point? Uh, little Miss Can't Be Wrong over there with the restraining order. She was in that jury that came back. And by the way, she was one of the ones who hung and wanted first degree murder on Connor. She one of two. She wanted for which they didn't. They she finally folded. But within. God Wait a knows, minute, on Connor. Connor was the, the – she was – Lacey was pregnant. Oh, with Connor. With Connor. Oh. And, oh, and, yeah. she, and she just got in there to do her um, to do her business. I mean it was incredible. They were so, when you place – by the way, another thing you should be aware of. Mm. When you replace a juror, you get an instruction under California law. Everything that's come before, put it aside. Mm-hmm. Okay. You have to start anew. It's a new panel, basically, because it's not the same 12. So they're basically, they, the evidence is they were hung, day seven. They substitute in, I, I believe two, I'd have to see two of the jurors after they remove two that are clearly hung. Within an hour, they get a guilty. I mean, it was just astonishing. Now, the whole point of that was... It's a circumstantial case to begin with. I don't care if you say you know the evidence, you don't know the evidence. I was there at a front row seat. Every single one of those witnesses was dismantled. The the thing that the the problem was is you had um these jurors who were not were not fair. Um now you have that situation and you have the a judge 
who confided in me that he was told by the chief justice, you're not going to let this thing hang. We're not going – we're not going to have this hang. Remember, 2003, 2004, we're still post-OJ mm-hmm. and po- PTSD uh, oh, OJ. Right, right. This judge was selected to make sure there was a No hung jury. Yep. Uh, honest question and no disrespect to yeah. uh, any of the uh, ladies listening. Uh, I got a mom. I got a sister. I got a wife. I got a daughter. daughter. You have a- Should we let women be jurors? <laughs> I, because I've some of the stuff that comes out of their mouth. Now I I'm going to re- I'm going to defend. Way- I'm going to defend women. Let me give you another example Boy, of a woman these- that I love. Woo! These people are are <laughs> modern artists with their stories. <laughs> their <laughs> recollections of conversations <laughs> don't. They, I'm they don't there. resemble uh, anything that's ever existed before. I've never. <laughs> I've had some of the most insane conversations with women about. I said what? And I did what? You knew you? Why, how'd you know what I was thinking? Like, so I'm trying. I'm for the, just asking. I'm okay. innocently asking. I'm trying a case for the third time. Anyone who's a, had an argument with a woman I'm knows gonna, like this is insane. No, I'm going to prove you your. All this I'm, I'm going to prove your point, but to the opposite conclusion. Can I do mm-hmm. that? Mm-hmm. I'm trying the third trial of a case. It's hung. Well, he he gets acquitted. It starts with 99 counts. He gets acquitted of a bunch of counts, but hung. Then the second trial, um, we're down to about 10 counts, not guilty on one. We're a third trial. I'm... We've done all of the witnesses. I'm in the Inland Empire. It's either Riverside or San Bernardino, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And it's a bad case. It's a sex case. And so I'm... Listening to the, their final witness for the prosecution is the retired investigating officer who's come back to summarize the evidence, basically, in a, in a weird way. And one of the things they put him on for is to talk about what my client said when he was arrested. Now, mind mm-hmm. you, I've tried this case twice, so I think I know the evidence. Right. And I'm sitting there and I'm writing on my yellow legal pad. And the cop, cop says, well, what did you find when you searched the house? And he says, well, I found some pornography on the computer. And I, I knew there was pornography. And he goes, um, and what kind of pornography was it? And he says, well, it was, a, it was a bestiality. Mm-hmm. And I knew there was bestiality on the computer. And he says, okay, what was it? And he says, well, it was a dog with a woman. Okay, fine. I knew it was there. That had come in the previous two trials. Did you ask the defendant about this? Yes, I did. What did he tell you? He says, he got hooked on it when he, when his, because his wife used to do it with their dog. His ex-wife used to do it with their dog. I had not made an objection to keep that out. I, I said, ju- time out, judge, can I approach? I approached. I said, judge, I had missed that. I should have motion eliminated that, uh, blah, blah, blah. I, I mean, the, the prosecution rests. I think it was a Friday. I spend the weekend. I want to kill myself. I, how did I let this come in? You know, his first wife was fucking the dog. You didn't know about it? I had completely missed that one statement. Or but, I had known it and should have done a motion to exclude it. Right. Okay. So we get back on Monday and I'm sick all weekend. We do the closing arguments. Jury's out for a couple of days. They come back. They acquit him of the pornography charge. And they're still, on, they're still hung on the, on, the, um, on the others. But they're hung like nine to three for not guilty. And so – uh, you know, he gets probation or on her way. But I talked to the jurors afterwards and my four, I think it was the four person, but I remember as juror number four. And I said, look, I got to be honest with you. I've been sick for 96 hours about like, I should have handled that. I should have preempted. I should have talked to you. And she goes, Oh, Mr. Garrigus, this is, I forget if she said Riverside or Rialto. This is Riverside. You should see what we do down here on Saturday night. <laughs> wow. Okay. So, All right. Well, I stand corrected. <laughs> there you go. Well, it proves your point about whatever, but there's a different conclusion. Did you, uh, Gary, did you find that article I was having you fish around for? Yeah, I did. It's a little extensive, so I don't know how much of it I can read, but I who can summarize. It? I'm sorry, so, what was that? Who wrote it? Uh, let me pull her name up here. It's uh, Lee Habib. Oh, Lee Habib. I think that may be a guy, but it, or maybe uh, not. Might be a guy. I'm not sure. I, yeah, on Prager's uh, site, it was a. But it was interesting. So yeah, give us a few beats, and I want to get Mark's kind of take on this because it was from a lot of it covered Glover, who was Brianna Taylor's boyfriend, X, the X. Oh, that was the X, who Sorry. was in custody at the time of Correct. the no knock, which they claim. 
that even though they had a no-knock, they still knocked. Right. Well, so I would argue that this story is is very much focused on the men in her life. It's yeah, focused and on it's Glover and Walker. Walker the, was the current boyfriend. Correct. Walker right. was the shooter. The, the, Who right. got charged right. and the right. dismissed. Right. 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 Charged and dismissed. And basically what the article lays out is that Glover was an – uh, objectively bad person who had a long histories of clashing with the law, incarceration, drug dealing, uh, involvement in potential murders or, or you know killings of some sort, and that Walker, her boyfriend who she was in the home with that night, was an objectively good guy who she had been with off and on for seven years. She met Glover during the time that seven year period. So, so Glover was, was this was this like good guy bad guy? You know, women like bad guys. I hate to say that, but. Bad boys. Why? Why do you care? You're bad. <laughs> <laughs> More pussy for you. <laughs> I'll you out here, Mark. Suffer. <laughs> uh, yeah. So it was. You know, it was basically sort of the um, the the difference between these two guys. And Walker yeah. was was by all intents a good dude who you know hardworking. And that's what I thought. Yeah. Everything I've heard about and him it, is that this guy was a stand up guy. And if, as I understand it, does this article is supposed to disabuse? My understanding was the reason he was armed was because of the other guy who he knew was. was a bad guy and wanted to protect Brianna. Yeah, and Gary can read on, Correct. but I'll I'll paraphrase. Yeah, paraphrase. So, Give me the crystal brain. The, the Brianna got caught up with this guy who was just a real fucking low life, and and he rented a car in her name, and they found a body, you know, executed sort of gang style really? in the back. That's yes. a fact I didn't know. It's 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 because the news is so busy with their How fucking narratives all the time. I it hasn't been widely described, but that detail is in fact in here. That's what I was alluding to with the killing. She rented a car, loaned it to him. And then they discovered an associate of his and kind of a Did they find the car at the video shop where they called Rudy Giuliani's lawyer <laughs> to, to, to turn in the missing emails? It didn't say, but they okay. found the body, the rental agreement with her name on it and three bags of drugs. So this guy was basically I mean, I think I think the takeaway is which and it's by the way, this happens so often. It's a guy who's using a female. Right. Right. So he so the bad guy, Glover. Right. Yeah. yeah he did, also, by the way, did she he, speaking? Was she ever a restraining order on this guy? She did not. But she. See, he, he was crazy. also. That's a that's a point in her defense. But he right. was also using her address on bank accounts that he had with Chase and stuff like that. So it's he, identity he, theft he was, as well. So what this guy was a bad dude. I guess he was older. He he was in I don't know St. Louis and then moved there. He moved whatever. He he had lots of scrapes with the law. You know, she bailed him out a few times. You know, rented the car with the body in it. Her name had bank accounts in her apartment. Address yeah, but there's never any indication that I've seen that she was a, a confederate. No, right? No, no. It, no. It, it the way this thing plays it out, it's it's it it makes sense. I think she met him when she was like 19. You know, it, it's it all kind of here's it, it it it's it's simpler in a weird way. It's it's a simpler case than we we've made it out to be young 19 year old girl gets hooked up with older bad boy gangster type gets kind of sucked into his world he starts using her for you know use your credit card to go rent me you know i'm sure he's saying i gotta drive to see my sick mom in florida I had my credit card revoked. Could I use? You know, he's she's what nineteen. Is, you know, every, whatever. Every yeah. father of a daughter's worst nightmare. Right, right. And he's using her, and he's all right. So, in doing this, <clears throat> he's a bad dude, and now the law's getting involved because they're busting him, and they're seeing the address or the credit card or who rented this or whatever. So now she's on their radar as well. And then she's bailing him out of jail and blah, blah, blah. Well, at some point she says, I want to be with the new guy, the better guy. And I guess they were back and forth a lot, but the new guy and the better guy is a licensed gun owner. Who's rightfully scared of the bad dude. Who's literally evidently having people executed gang style. So he, he knows That's what just this wild, th he knows what this guy's capable of. So he's, Sleeping with a fucking gun by his bed because he's in the apartment, which is the same address that this guy has used for the bank account, blah, blah, blah. So then, according to his testimony, 
uh, you know, they, they stay in, they go to bed and watch a movie, they go to bed. And at some period after that, they wake up uh, because I guess there's pounding on the door because they are yelling in his grand jury testimony. Brianna and him are standing in the hallway yelling at the door. Who is it? Multiple who, times. Who is it? So that would suggest somebody knocked or woke them up and they're yelling, who is it? They it could have? Or that somebody, you looked at the door. What did you think about I, the door? I don't, Circumstantial the, evidence the, expert the, carpenter. If if three cops with a you know portable battering ram or even a boot or whatever, if if they couldn't get in after a shot or two, I mean, if she was asleep, sorry, go ahead. Based on what I've read, it seems like they both tend to agree that there was banging on the door before a battering ram got involved. Right, and then the then the door blows open. Of course, the good boyfriend, the licensed gun owner assumes that's the drug dealing murdering bad boyfriend who's come in here right. if he knows the it's the police there's nothing to indicate this guy would ever why would he shoot at the police he he does right he wouldn't he wouldn't so he and sees, by the way why is he bad um when he's sitting in his apartment and the two lawyers in st louis are good when they're standing outside of their house, I mean, I, within the curtilage, but I could get into all of that. I well, mean, they, I wish he's people not, would just well, be consistent. He was never indicted because it's a you know they have a castle doctrine. I thought he was charged though, wasn't he, Gary? He was for a time. He was charged with murder, and then it was dismissed. Yeah, that right. drives me crazy. They don't have anything on him. Right. All he knows is people are standing in his. So, so can you shoots. imagine if you're in that situation? I mean, wouldn't I mean? I don't know. It just it drives. He shoots. Right. The cops don't get indicted because they got fired on. And he, here's where we here's where we ended up. Un, right. un, un, and I'll tell you, really, uh, the more I've delved into this, the person who really set this in motion was the what they call the affiant, um, because there's so much that should have been plumbed that wasn't plumbed that was false in getting that. And the affiant, the, the affiant is the person who actually. Uh, swore on the affidavit for the search warrant. Oh, like an affirmation? Yeah. They, uh, the, uh, affid- uh, the person who swears on the affidavit is usually referred to as the affiant. Um, yeah, and of course, because we have a society that's that's backwards, uh, the person that is really responsible for all this is Walker, uh, sorry, Glover, the the bad boyfriend. This this guy's the drug dealing, murdering sleaze who basically got her killed exactly. through his relationship with them. We have no interest in in him at all as a society. But uh, if he was never born, then she would still be alive. <laughs> all right, let me hit uh, Madison Reed, Mister. Well, Madison Reed, Madison Reed makes great hair coloring for women, and they've done it. For a long time. Lynette's used it and Gina uses it. And at some point they said, well, what about Madison Reed, mister? What if we did something for the guys? A little gray blending, natural color. It works for your hair, works for your beard. You can uh, go check out the before and after shots. It's no shoe polish look. And uh, maybe you want a little more pepper and a little less salt. Madison Reed, mister. Makes it easy to find your color match. You just go to the website. Quick and easy. Just put a little dollop. I've done this. Put a dollop on your hands. Put the gloves on. Just run it through your hair. Let it sit. Run the activator through there. Let it sit for 10 minutes. Rinse it. And Bob's your uncle. You're shining like a new dime. Madison Reed, Mr. Right, Gary? That's absolutely right. Go to MadisonReedMr.com. That's M-A-D-I-S-O-N. R E E D M R dot com and use code Adam ten for ten percent off plus free shipping on your first box. Again, that's code Adam ten. Well, Mark had a bunch of other stories he wanted to talk about, but I know well, I you think we got kind a, of we kind, kind of, of hard out. Today. I do, and we we I can't believe we only hit a couple of subjects. Maybe this week we'll do a special RD for fifteen minutes or twenty minutes. What do you think? I'm always around for you, buddy. Thank you. I uh, appreciate it. Speaking of us, we're going to be doing a live show. We'll do a live reasonable doubt at the uh, West Palm Beach Improv. That'll be coming up November twenty first. Mark and I'll be up on special, stage. Special? Will that be our special Thanksgiving edition? Yes. Of 
yes. reasonable doubt. Our special Thanksgiving <laughs> edition. And uh, November 20th, November 21st, I'll be at West Palm Beach. So doing stand-up, late show, podcast, uh, early show. But and- are you going to do two shows on the day of the podcast or not? Yes. Three shows, including the podcast, Gary? Well, on the, days of, on the day with reasonable doubt, there'll be three. Three shows. Yes. Well, you were getting hammered at the red iguana. <laughs> Or the blue iguana. The blue iguana. I was sweating you were my sweating ass your ass off, shaking so. my money maker up on stage when we were in Salt Lake. <laughs> yeah, I've done. Okay, I'll remember that. I'll pace myself for uh, West Palm Beach, but they better not have a Don Julio 1942 crisis in Florida. Why do I, I doubt say. that Mark's going to pace himself when we're outside of Utah? <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, exactly. Utah. Gary was there when I was complaining to the poor cocktail waitress about how Utah makes me uh, not want to drink because you can only – if you're going to get an ounce at a time and you can't get doubles, it, it defeats the whole purpose. I concur. Yeah. All right. So go to amcrawl.com for all the live shows. Uh, what do you got? I've got um, – Southampton, we're still open. Go by Naya at uh, the Capri Hotel. V Palm Springs has now got Sonder uh, in, in place for the hotel. And Gigi's and Elixir for food and beverage. Go by Casa Tropicana. We've got a uh, special surprise down there for you. And Engine Company 28 and Tenny protected by the hot dog truck downtown L.A. So until next time, Adam Carolla for Mark Garriga saying mahala. Thanks for listening to Reasonable Doubt. Tune in next Saturday for an all-new episode.